I do have exhibits. I think it may be a little easier for us just to go to them once we get through versus so y'all can go back and forth. But as far as the drinking water goes, uh, updates and needs, um, the first item on our list is the North Lounge at Spring Creek Connection. Uh, is basically complete. Uh, one of the last things was paving at the Skipper Bridge lift station and fencing that. They paved yesterday, I believe, to be fencing in the next week or so. So, for all practical purposes, that's complete. And this was a two phase project that was approximately 6.7 miles of 12 inch water main. It went from Nelson Hill uh, up to Lewis Richardson and followed the power lines and back around and called up where we put the other section on Stafford Wright Road. Um, and this will supply the Bemis area with water from the Stone Creek wells and the Kinderly wells. You may notice the little area I had there. It is Stone Creek and Kinderly wells that that comes from. And this was for our issues with trihalomethanes and halo acidic acids that we needed to do this. Uh, the next item is the Valtech booster station. Uh, it is in need of a permanent generator that was is put on our budget, but uh, this is a major component of our interconnected water system now. EPD requires a backup there, and it's just to continue to ensure a continuous water supply for that Stone Creek and Bemis area. We don't want to have to be dependent on our connections to the city there in the event we got a water outage or whatever. So that is definitely in need of the permanent. Generator there. The next item is our North Lounge and South Lounge interconnection. Uh, we sort of got a little behind on this due to one of our wastewater projects that being the Coleman Road. We'll get to that in a minute. But uh, look to be having the engineering done on this hopefully uh, late summer, or early fall of this year. And this will tie the, the North uh, Lounge and the South Lounge water system together. It'll be going through an existing utility easement, so we don't have to worry about anything there. This will have all of our water systems tied in together, with the exception of Creekside West and Alapa Hall. Uh, right in conjunction with that project will be number four there, and it's the I-75 makes an 11, 12-inch connector. Currently, we only have a 8-inch water line that is feeding that side of the interstate around into 11, and it is near capacity and the fact that if there's high or slow or whatnot, it can create some pressure issues. So this will just take care of what we talked about there and, and having a good capacity there with that 12 inch. It'll go through a, it will have to bore I 75 on that and it will go uh, through the Touchton Road area there where we already have an easement uh, one place there across private property then the bottom of the Touchton Road up to lock on. Our water meters, uh, we are not changing out totally like the city is, Scott. We're, we already have the radio read meters, uh, and this still requires drive by. It don't require people getting out of every individual meter if they're working correctly. We sort of got kind of an eight ball on getting some of these radio read dials changed out. And we still had a few older meters uh, out of our approximately 8,000 total, a little over 8,000 at this point. We still have in the neighborhood of 500 older non radio read meters, looking at about 115,000 to replace them. And then we have about 1,500 that uh, we need to replace out the dials on, uh, probably around 250 to do that. Uh, I gave you all an update on this last year. And, had great anticipation and expectations that we would get on that and make a lot happen with growth and preventative maintenance and maintenance and everything else that we've not done as well as I had hoped we would. I feel like this is something we can't handle if we can ever get over the hump. So what I'm looking at there is maybe getting a contract to come in and help us get this call at one time. And then my two meter readers should be able to have a read of the meters and taking care of these because the batteries steadily die on the older units. They're projected in the last 10 years. Some conditions cause them to go out quicker. Uh, cold weather is when they really get us, and that's why we're back up to these numbers right now versus what we showed y'all last year. We have changed out a lot of meters, but uh, I believe if we can do that, that will uh, improve our efficiency and customer service on being able to 
that this gives us our ability to do the graphs when people call in and question their, their readings and whatnot. Another big item? Is that a question? Do you have any additional? I just, um, I, mean, I just think this is an area where, where we need to get caught up. And I feel like that, you know, the people question the validity of their bill, the operation of the meters themselves. And, you know, I mean, every time somebody has a high meter reading, I mean, and I tell you, every time I ask Steve about it, he runs it to the ground and figures it out. And more times than not, it wasn't an error, it was extra irrigation or whatever. But it's just, I think mean, it's just an area where we can be more efficient. And I'd like to see make a plan for trying to get all those changed out as quickly as we can. And I think at the end of the day, it's the right thing to do, and we, and we save money by, by doing this, right? I mean, we, we definitely will. And, and the other thing you say is it does help us with our customers because if, if we have a radio read that's not working properly, we may not be able to get a graph off of them every time. Uh, just in case you have heard the information that the city is doing now, we, we do not have those type meters. That would be a several million dollar project to change out. They are going with a meter where they can read everything from the office. You could have a person sit across the desk from you and say, I'm not using water, I guarantee you, you on what they're going to, you can pull that up on the computer and say, well, there's 25 gallons of minute going through your meter as we sit here right now. We have never, uh, chosen to do that, that is relatively new technology, and the city has chosen to go that route. I believe all of their customers, I think that's a $9 million project. It's quite huge. But I think this will get us, if we can get to here, that will help us a lot. Anybody else got any questions on this? At least was in up to this point. I, I got one, if, if I may, yes. that it, it, it's not specifically about water meters, but it is relative. We've had an issue in the past, and this was pre-Steve Stallion, apparently with some systems that had, or some developments that had been approved where the tap for the water and the sewer were extremely deep. Yep. And we've had developers that actually has had to get someone in there with a heavy excavator to be able to reach it, and of course, once you get below a certain depth, you've got to go into shoring and a, from right. a safety standpoint. That is a big expense again that just hits somebody blindside. Mm -hmm. So, from this point, <coughs> Steve Stalvey point on, from developments, do we have a minimum depth for where that tap is to be located? When we make our changes to the ULDC, it will be my recommendation that every sewer tap is up out of the ground minimum two feet with a cap on it on any new construction. And then when the developer comes in there, he can cut that off wherever he needs. That problem come up this week. You may have heard it. No, I haven't. I haven't but it has come up in the past. Now, where we did help a bit was in the North Lake area, there was uh, the gas fields out there were no good and incomplete totally. And there was a, a few places where that line was approximately 15, 18 feet deep that the county did go in and assist on that. And it was strictly because the decision was made, I think, through uh, some of y'all that since we couldn't tell them anything because of our ass bills. Now, the one that came up this week was on Kitter Loop and our ass bills are excellent out there. And I don't feel like that it's our job from the way we have been so far to go out there because they are difficult to find sometimes. That's why I want to see them out of the ground. It's just like I literally stopped by our office this morning and my, my lead guy was talking about that one in Kinderley was at, at 9 feet deep. Across the street, it was at 2 foot deep, but then the distance away from the mains. And my thing is, granted, Developers might not like to see them. Uh, Mr. Tillman is an excellent developer, I think. He don't want to see any of that stuff out of the ground. But I say we put it out of the ground. That way it's visible to us. We know where it's at. And then if the developer comes in, his plumber can put it down to the level they need, and that will solve that problem. Agree 100%. Yeah. So, can I ask 
So are we, Mike, when we vote to approve a subdivision plan, do we have as bills at that point? And should we look at maybe saying the Board of Commissioners is not approving your, your subdivision plans until as bills have been verified and signed up? I don't sign a plat until me and Steve review the as bills and we approve the as bills. I don't sign a plat. But again, from an as-built standpoint, all that is is that the utility contractor is saying this is where it's at. Mike and Steve can't go out there and dig it up or be there where they're putting it in to inspect that process. So you're going by just the factor that the developer said that it's two feet down when it could be ten feet down. So, you know, I... So it all comes back to, to what Steve is saying. If those stubs are visible, the first thing a developer does on a project, Scotty, you know, you've got to have water. So the first thing that you see in most all of these developments is that you see a water line stubbed up. Well, the sewer line should be the same thing. Yes. And all of that tapping into our system needs to be done at that point, and it's turned out, and then all they've got to do is dig down, cut the pipe off, and elevation they need for the attachment and run it in there. I no. personally never had an issue with this at all, whether it's a D1 connection or whether it's a regular sewer job. I've never had the problem. But I mean, it still sounds like regardless, somebody's got to verify that those as built are true and correct. I mean, because even if you say, okay, well, they've got to be stuck up out of the ground or two feet. Well, who's going out there to spot check those ground or, or whatever to verify that I mean, I'm not saying you have to look at the as bills and go dig a hole and verify that they're exactly right, but he just said a second ago that the as bills weren't accurate. So, I mean, how, what is the check and balance there? How do we... We do have an inspector that looks at the development, but he can't be there for every bit of it. Um, you know, we, we run across just in this past year where one of our contractors was covering up the one lines seven inches deep and he did we caught that because we got there but ultimately you know in a perfect world all these tasks they're gps in but we don't have the capability of doing that right now but is that something that we want to go to you know that's going to be more cost on the developer but it it's not unheard of in the, in the development world now and putting this stuff in to you gps in all your valves your connections and all of that it is a normal cost, but is that what we're going to do? What do we follow? Any other comments, questions? See you on that. I've got to do one more real quick. I can't leave it. You can't leave this to. Water tank maintenance. Uh, I have, uh, I'm not going to say I've dropped the ball on that, but we have not got that accomplished. But I do have a contract with the county attorney now that I feel like is should not take him very long to approve uh, unless he's going. So I'll leave that at that. But uh, basically, uh, that will what we're looking at here is a long-term contract uh, that will take care of our maintenance on the inside and outside of our tanks, meet all of our APD requirements and everything. On the last note on water is the hydrogen peroxide treatment. Um, this is something we're looking at at uh, label alcohol, and it says in your book that we are looking at a potential agreement with EDD. You'll get this in the mail, Sharon, that was approved on the 31st to give us the ability to do the peroxide uh, type study at label alcohol. There are several. Uh, Cities in uh, North Florida is using peroxide very effectively on uh, trial methane and haloacetic acids, and it's very cheap and to uh, install and to operate, and they're having very much success with that. And this will help us tremendously in the hall. It would also give us the ability to put that spring creek well back online, possibly. So we'll be hopefully have some good news for y'all next year about that. Uh -huh. Question. Uh -huh. uh, 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 uh,
location in about Brown River. Yes, sir. And so forth and all. But uh, I recall seven years ago, we, we agreed to do different stays, and we even thought that my sister was supposed to be the state of the park. Yes, sir. So, so I guess what kind of transpired is, is the level of the river or what's going on? The, the river does influence the water quality out there greatly. Uh, in my system, I'm not a huge fan of it, I'll, I'll say that. Uh, and my people that operate that are less fans of it. We have it, we're doing you know, the best we can with it. We're hoping that this peroxide, even if it's in conjunction with that, will help us with that tremendously. Before we purchased the bikes, we, we had all types of studies. We, we had some great hopes. Right. <laughs> you know, like I say, uh, well, we spent over a million dollars we did. Uh, for it. And long story short, you know, last year, I, you know, several calls about the horse field being brown on it, what it's going to do. I don't know what the hiking the rock type people consist of, but say hypothetically, bring back some results, what kind of what kind of remedies do you want to provide? Or what are the results that come back with? If if this comes back and does the work that we need it to, basically to it's going to help us in multiple ways here. It's going to give us a much greater capacity water wise. The myatic system we went from having four hundred gallon a minute wells out there to fifty four gallons a minute. So we're we're limited on our capacity out there. And that's one of the big things we're looking at is trying to increase that capacity back because, again, the million dollars only gave us the 54 gallons a minute. Uh, so we need any capacity. And if we're able to do this, possibly with the addition of maybe $250,000 worth of tanks uh, for capacity, and that gives us more treatment uh, uh, capabilities also. As you recall, at the time that we purchased the money, Obviously, peroxide was not a viable option. And the options that we had at that time, when we met with other property owners and said, it's going to be a very expensive project, or we'll get it back to you. You operate it. You run it. And they all, to a person, said, oh no, oh no, we'll be happy. Has it proven as successful as we had hoped it would be, or as hopeful as the individual were? But Steve and I have discussed it uh, a number of times looking for other alternatives. This seems to be the only viable option right now, and that is based on this test. Is that what, yes. Mm -hmm. What kind of cost are we looking at on this peroxide system upgrade? Uh, right. The biggest thing we would need is, is we would want to increase our pumps again. So I just want to throw out a number. I'm not really prepared for that, but I would say 300000 or less for that, maybe, maybe 250 or less. Uh, and the reason I ask that question, Steve, is because if, if we're having flow problems, but you're saying that's due to the MIAX system is reducing the flow. Right. Do we also have a need, because I don't know anything about the wells, do we have a need for a new well? If we can, our wells had 400 gallon net pumps on it, and we can put the 400 gallon net pumps right back in those wells and then buy them, and that would give us the flow rates that we needed, then we got to have tank capacity. And part of uh, peroxide is, is um, contact time. So that's something that we're actually with the smaller pumps is working good. It's giving us contact time in the lines. But when we go to those larger pumps, we would have to have the tanks, maybe a couple of additional 20,000 gallon tanks. And I, the price I got on them earlier this year, we were just going to possibly have a deep one of them strictly for capacity, is about 100,000 each on them. So, um, well, and kind of where I'm going with this, if theoretically, if a new well is born, is the potential there to 
to get to better quality water than what we currently have? I don't think so, okay. not unless we got miles further away from that river. Gotcha. Okay. And okay. then you got getting the pipe in the river. Sure. To the sure. Miles. Gotcha. So that's, okay. But I don't believe you want to improve, improve the quality anywhere within that lake and not call area. I think it's a tannic gas. That tannic gas and then the water in the soil. Yeah. You got to get out of it. It won't hurt you. Tannic gas won't hurt you. Mike, is there any other you know, options? I mean, other, I guess, counties or probably trying to deal with similar yes. situations? There's an Adam Gilchrist thing. Moody has it. I come from that. It, it's great. That's about $3 million for us there. And the potential for growth on rate payers out there is slim to none. We, we will never pay for that right. in any of our lifetimes. We won't ever get a return on that initial investment that we exactly. made. So it, it's just, it comes all the way back around full circle to a concern that I've had for a long time, and it comes back to these community water systems, that unless we put some sort of definitive requirements on capacity, quality, so that we can have assurance that in those subdivisions that have them, that not only does the homeowners have them, but we've got when we stick a fire hydrant and require that the hydrant is out by the curb, we don't need a false pretense that you're going to get the water you need out of that hydrant. We need to be darn sure that when that hydrant has to be tapped, that we're not going to when the bumper truck hooks to it, it ain't going to suck the toilets out of the house trying to get water. We've got to be sure of that. And I think that that, again, is something as we move through this whole process that we've got to address. We've talked about it for a couple of years. And, uh, this is something that's going to have to be addressed. Wastewater. The Coleman Road lift station and force main upgrade. This is going to be a new triplex station and a new 24 inch force main from Coleman Road to James Road. It's approximately 4.5 miles. Uh, hopefully we can get this out of bid in March. Uh, uh, Lovell is relatively finished up with just about everything. Uh, you know, this is the line we've had the, the several breaks on. We've got that line that just about to be replaced due to age and quality of pipe. Uh, we also look at growth, and granted, it, it's going wild out there, but they feel like that this should carry us through. 2035 at least. The land application side, uh, one of the things we got to look at is increasing our terminal capacity with our growth. We're, we're beginning to bump against that, so we, we're going to try to be on the ball with that uh, to be working with that. We had one field that we took out of egg production last year. I'm hoping to spring that field this year, and that would be right in line with increasing that permit capacity. Hopefully, we can get that approved to go ahead and put in for irrigation uh, for spring at home. The solar bees and the LG sonic on the Hogan Pond is complete. The drying beds are complete there as part of our renovations I talked about last year. And then I said last year, y'all are very aware that our five strong contract is uh, signed and done. Actually, I can check for that this week. So that will probably start harvesting five strong soon. And list stations, uh, some of the things we want to look at here is permanent bypass pumps for our five trunk line stations. That would be Bevel Creek, Francis Lake, Quiet Water, Blue Lake, and Highway 84. Reason being for that is as we move forward, bypass pumps are becoming much more common than generators at lift stations for emergency backup. And the reason being is, you know, if you had a tornado come through or something, granted that pump could be get some damage, but if you have a, a lightning strike or whatever that takes out your controls and, and pops your pump there, it, it don't matter if the generator runs or not, you're still dead in the water with your bypass pump, you got something that's gonna move the, the sewage on down the line. Additionally, those bypass pumps work off uh, technology has got that where they come on and off as flow demands. So you're not sitting there running those pumps 24 hours a day like you are your generator for it to be ready. So you're going to save on uh, fuel and uh, they're, they're going to be better all the way around. We want to look to begin to go ahead and get those changed.
change driver that's called the road will be backed up with bypass funds. VFDs are another thing we're wanting to put on these truck line stations. The Colvin Road will come with that, and uh, that will bring the Francis Lake very part of this project we're doing. And we that will help us on the number of stops and starts, and, and that helps on one hour in the line and everything else. It's just much more efficient with the VFDs. So it helps also on the utility cost for the terrain. Right. Those pumps are much more efficient. That's right. Uh, the blowers for the fog, that's that oil and grease control. We have put in a few of these and they are showing uh, good results on the grease building up our lift stations and mains. Uh, I had talked about owning last year over, over our control panels at the station. You maybe noticed some of these, but we're, we're moving along with them and that's just helping. We did notice some good results last year where we lost many more points marks than the year before just due to the excessive heat in the from the summer, these little shades are, are helping us there. We had the grassy pond sewer connection this year. I, I think you may remember us talking about that. This was a project that we did under the Moody OEM contract. And we tied all the grassy pond sewer onto the county. Uh, this should be finished up in February or March. They get out on another little part. I actually got an email on the funding complete from yesterday, so they're changing out some piping that they can't provide. So. Uh, another thing on the waste where we have an E1 force main upgrade that will need to take place, and we hope to get that on here early in the year, and that's up off of Venus, not so Academy Old Venus, and Sherry, you may remember us talking about that, and that was due to um, just additional growth that's required a bit larger pipe on, on the lower end of that in conjunction with road that's already uh, approved basically out there on that Venus uh, landing area. Preventive maintenance, do we want to go over and just keep moving on that? Preventive maintenance needs on drinking water. Uh, we actually have a valve exercise we're in our budget this year. We just got to probably hopefully transition that out at about the same time. And, uh, one of the things I'll discuss with Mr. Pritchard on that is getting that and then having the the personnel to operate that, so then we'd be looking at two personnel to <coughs> have that program going. As we connected all these water systems together, we haven't had a system water model done in, in a number of years that I know of, and I, I think we just need to be planning for this, especially after we get the, the North Clouds and South Clouds put together. Uh, that helps us tremendously. It'll help the fire department in, in a lot of areas and seeing you know, where our flushing needs may be and the different things and flows that we have available. On the wastewater side, we need to uh, be looking pretty heavily at lift station rehab and manual rehab, and then an easement right away clear, and I put some uh, numbers out there on that. I know on some of our easements, we've got a couple of them that's pretty, pretty thick and nasty, and it's, you know, there's potential for us to have a problem there. We, we need to be able to get to it take care of the problem, not be spending the first day and a half trying to get a pool out of escalator in there, it's where we can get to it. Are there questions on the preventative maintenance? Are you doing that? Yeah, uh, just topics of discussion. Uh, I think I'll probably get every one of y'all possibly at, at on the side or whatever we have official talks on it, but one of the biggest things that uh, when when I go to conferences or talk to people and you know we get to talk about I tell them the number of lift sessions we have and how far we pump and then with our growth, you know, when when Lowndes County Utilities started out, everything was, it was perfect. The LAS was down there. There will never be another place located any better than that from a drainage standpoint and a suitability standpoint as that property. But when we start thinking about that, we're pumping all the sewage from Hay Hire, exit 22, and from Moody Air Force Base at Family Pizza. Not that we have Moody Air Force Base and sewer, but every bit of that pumps all the way across the pond. That, that blows people's mind when I start talking about that distance at all. With growth and everything, we need to seriously be looking at uh, land for a new LAS. Um, we don't have that on that map, but that interactive map you have there, you can 
pull down there, there's something down on soil types. Uh, you really can't see it greatly, but you can get on your own computer and expand that out and see. But we just need to really be looking at that. Uh, a new elevated tower in the north end, somewhere on Union Road, maybe or 41. And ultimately, what will happen at that point is we will tie Creek Side West into that, and that will give Creek Side West the capacity that they need. The fire protection, the whole nine yards that's needed there will take care of any issues we have there. Additional tank capacity at Lake Lake Hall. It's going to help us with the, just the capacity needs in general and the fire flow. The uh, the current uh, Hay Hire Industrial Park yes, sir. is served by the Hay Hire. Hay Hire. Uh, well, there are some discussions about the possibility of expanding that project as well. I mean, what we're talking about have, have already discussed. Um, the parks and rec facility that's going in and the potential growth for it as well. Is is that an area where you would be looking at for an elevated tower or are you looking for something as you said out on the Union Road area? Well my thought is is I was thinking Union Road if, if we could project any growth wherever up that way uh, because ideally we've got to get what I would like to have is, is a line that ties in there at, it will be a class stone now, and get us a line out there that serves all the way up to the Greek side west. So area. you're looking at running pipe to pipe up Union Road from wherever this location would be, so that would give utilities there on Union Road. That's for right. Or uh, 41 ways and they cross over, whatever, but ultimately we would want Creek side west tied on to our Gotcha. one water system that we will have for the North Lake South. Okay, so I was just thinking about that expansion in the uh, in the industrial park too up there. And then what you're really talking about the possibility of some future services and such around that exit 29. Yeah. I really wouldn't get that tower paint out of as over there that would be the best thing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there you go play. <laughs>
contractors are hungry. It might go a little bit closer to that lower end if everything's flowing and going. You might be closer to that higher end. But you see the pricing there, it's all relatively self-explanatory on the pipe and the amounts there. Then we get to the water towers or water storage tanks. You've got the elevated tower first. Uh, estimates of 200, and, I mean, excuse me, two and a half million for a 500,000 gallon and then a 500,000 gallon brown storage tank, estimates of a million. What can factor in on that elevated tank is uh, how much site work is required and then the makeup of the soil. They do geo testing on the soils and, you know, if you've got a good strong structured soil, you might drop that by 15, 20 percent uh, for that. Water supply, uh, Chairman, this was something that I asked specifically about, but you just mentioned all these independent water systems and going hand in hand with developers' calls. Uh, what, this, what this would amount to here, he said the difference in six and eight inch wells didn't, didn't really make that much difference. But if we put these in to the capacity standards and have the amount of tanks available in the water, uh, the wells, got to have two of them for a pity purpose, they got to be generator backed up. Then you've got to have the block building, uh, the well house for all the controls with the chemical uh, inputs and all of that. They're estimating out at about $800,000, you know, for, and that can be, you know, it, it, it really don't change a lot as whether you got a uh, 65 lot subdivision or up to a 250 lot subdivision, you know, when you ideally you would get there and like, let's just say water wasn't available with those three guys out on Valley Road to get together, this could possibly take care of 800 to a million and take care of their water system if they could work together to make that happen and have a that for, for somebody. But when you get that up there to meet those standards and, and those fire hydrants truly be where you can pull up to them, then you've got to have the capacity there for holding and putting back in and that's was an estimate on that. Well again I, I, I go back to the same thing that I've had. I mean we've either got to require these developers that do choose to put in a community water system. We've got to give assurance to the citizens that buy those lots, buy those homes, that when a fire truck pulls up the hydrant, the flow is going to be there. We've got too many now that we don't have. Right. So, and then with the fact that we potentially, as we've shown in like the Lapa Hall, we could have to eventually take those systems over, and then they are our systems. That's right. So my question is all has been all along is that do we need to consider updating those requirements, and or do we need to look at in these areas where potentially development begins and we begin to see that growth and we don't have our system there, is it something that we may want to consider in the future to put in the, the, a county community water system for that area? Right. If the private sector can do it, then we, my point, we should be able to do it. And at the same time, we could do it by the standards that that we need so that when that in the event that we had to take one over, we know what we've got. We both, ours would always be our system. I think what I see right now is we require the piping to go in the hydrant store and everything. I think most of them just come up short of capacity and those hydrants actually being That's it. That's it. We 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 can't continue down that path. Right. Wastewater uh, projected pricing, mid-size lift station, 350000 eight-inch sewer force main, uh, for the total project, about $80 a linear foot. Uh, Jack and Moore across, uh, I think this one here may be a little high, uh, but Jack and Moore's, uh, $300 a linear foot. Um, just to back up just a, a, a step just for, for Steve, your 2020 
utilities, your drinking water update, if you call it that, and the wastewater update, those projects. Are those projects that you're looking for budgeting for 2020-21, or what, what is your, uh, I mean, can you complete all these projects in the year's budgeting process? Not everyone. Well, there again, that's kind of, and I'm sure Mr. Pitcher will have to work through that. We pretty much have a cold road all year, Marcus Sloss, and you know, some of these others I think we, we have put in our budget and we'll be working through that. But these are your, what you're saying, these are your issues and concerns that you have now that's going to have to be addressed either shortly or in the near future? Yes. These are really long term solutions. These need to be done short term. These all need to be put very quickly. Gotcha. If you want to take a quick look through your exhibits, uh, exhibit A, this just shows the routes of those water veins, and this was at North Lowndes and Spring Creek interconnection. The red line shows it uh, starting over on your left hand side from Nelson Hill all the way back over and it terminates at Skipper Bridge Lift Station, which is uh, just across from Cherry Creek Baptist Church, if you know where that's at. Mm -hmm. uh, exhibit B, that was where I was talking about the backup generator. And this is on Balfour Road, that's that booster station uh, that is in need of that backup generator. Exhibit 3 is that uh, north south center connection that catches there at, uh, near the Dollar General on 84 at James Road, it goes through the existing utility easement down to Mesa 13, crossing Indian 4, I think it is. Uh, exhibit D is the little connector I was telling you about. This is crossing down on the bottom of the page. It's basically right where Whitewater Road parallels back up in the interstate here in the freight liner. It shoots across there and goes over to Touchton Road. Follows Touchton Road up to uh, Madison Highway, and I believe we peel around on Madison to get to the 12 inch section. Exhibit E is your Colton Road, Force Main at the top of the page is the Colton Road lift station running down crossing the interstate and down Valtech Road to Highway 133 and then around the existing easement to James Road. And the E1, the Exhibit F is your E1 upgrade on uh, Venus sites, old Venus sites, I believe it's old, old Venus and Venus sites. Then, after that, you just want to put three pages. That's an example of your 500,000 gallon elevated tank, Kimberly tank. There's your example of your concrete uh, 500,000 gallon ground storage. You have the 20,000 gallon water tank down in Olapa Hall. Just a picture of one of the owners of the control panels. And that's a picture of the completed drive there with the LMS last picture. Any uh, questions or comments on any of this? Marcus, you good? Mark, you good? Jim, you good? Clay, you good? Scotty, you good? You good? You good? All right. Um, I think that lunch is here. If y'all are agreeable, we will take uh, an hour of break. Lord, we just thank you for this day. Thank you for the many blessings that you provide for us each and every day. Lord, we just ask that you give us wisdom as we handle the county business at hand, Lord, and just give us the vision, Lord. But most of all, let us seek your will and your way on everything we do, Lord. We thank you for the food that's been provided. We just ask that you nourish it in our bodies and us to your service. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Amen. amen.